Hello. So my name is Harander Inki Solerson. <laughs> uh, close captioning is probably not going to capture that one. Um, that's me. That's my daughter, Emma. Um, I actually have two beautiful children out of uh, a three total, which is not a, a bad ratio. Um, I've been asked to say some words to close out this conference today. Um, some words that maybe tie everything together, maybe make this whole thing make sense. And I don't know if I can do that, but I'll, I'll give it my best. Um, before I begin, I just want to warn you at the end of the talk, you might feel an urge to do a standing ovation. I've, I've seen that happen in the past. Uh, I've never done uh, one of these in, uh, remotely, but I, I think um, even if you're home alone, uh, I think a standing ovation is totally appropriate uh, and, and you shouldn't feel awkward if you just get that urge. So just lean into that. Um, before we start, it might be also worthwhile to give you a little bit of an introduction about myself and the agency I started a few years ago. It's called Ueno, um, and we often get asked this, and it's pr pronounced Ueno, which is like Bueno without the B. And at Ueno, we create things like digital brands and products and experiences, um, and we work with many of the, the most innovative companies in the world. We work with companies like Uber, on helping them find their identity and expressing it through places like uber.com, the Uber apps, and multiple other platforms. We work with uh, Google on more projects than I can count. We helped Oculus launch some of their products. We worked with Apple on things like Apple Maps. We helped reimagine Lonely Planet for the digital age. We do a lot of work on, on video platforms, for example, this one. Um, from Red Bull and Red Bull TV. We worked with LeBron James to create his platform, Uninterrupted. Reuters, companies like Slack, um, and Splunk, which is a uh, data something. And then uh, startups like Cowboy, which is an electric bike brand we have created and launched in, in Europe. Zero, a fintech company. Blah, blah, blah. There's, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, hold on. What? Okay. So what I'm trying to say here is, um, and, and this is sort of the social proof aspect of the talk, uh, is we do really great work. And um, we get all sorts of awards. We keep like getting industry awards like the Webbies, and we get Adweek awards and, and Inc. awards. and um, and all sorts of stuff. And here's me getting an award from the president of Iceland. Um, uh, he's the one in the middle, not, not the not the kid. Uh, I'm not sure what it was for, but I think it was basically for something like, you know, best at everything. It was something like that. I, I can't honestly remember. But I wasn't sure what I should talk about today. Um, but then, um, you know, after a lot of introspection, there's... Uh, it was kind of obvious uh, that it, when it hit me, I should obviously talk about something that I know and something that I really love. Um, I should talk about myself. Uh, um, because the thing is, I've, I've been on uh, this, this, this thing, this journey over the last couple of years. And, um, well, like all good journeys, this one um, starts with a monkey. Um, in the early 20th century, psychology was a new science. And uh, a lot of psychologists believed that parental love was not needed, that all babies needed was food and shelter. So in a, a series of, of very, very, as you can imagine, controversial experiments, a, a psychologist named Harry Harlow set out to prove um, that love and connection are a critical part of our upbringing. And to prove this, he removed young rhesus monkeys from their mothers at birth. He was not a nice guy. He isolated them 
He gave them access to a, a very crude doll that could feed the monkeys. Um, the, the doll had, as you can see, a bottle, it had milk. And um, if the theory of the day was true, then the monkeys would be totally fine. They had shelter um, and they got all the sustenance they needed. But as you can imagine, as anyone with common sense could imagine, the monkeys were not fine. They grew up having very serious emotional damage. So, um, Harlow uh, decided to add a second doll, a second mother. Um, this one had a, a more realistic face, and importantly, it also had cloth that was similar to the skin of monkeys, similar to the touch. It did, however, not have any milk, so it couldn't really feed the monkeys. It couldn't really give it anything other than just that feeling. Um, but what happened was that the baby monkeys spent a significantly, uh, significantly more time with the cloth mother than with the wire mother. Um, you know, they went to the, the wire mother when they needed food, but otherwise they mostly spent time with the cloth mother. They got safety, they got comfort, and they got belonging from the cloth mother. So at the time, even though it seems obvious to us now, um, the result of the hollow experiment was, was groundbreaking. Um, because although we all instinctively know this, hollow proved that, that monkeys and, and by extension humans don't just have functional needs. We don't just need food, and shelter to live. Um, we need connection, and we need um, to belong, and we need love. So why am I telling this story? Um, it's obviously uh, a bit of a downer. But um, I'm telling you this because I believe that um, we as a, as a society have treated technology and the internet and digital products and brands in the same way as the psychologists of the early 20th century thought about parental connection. Um, we've been running this sort of huge, massive, tech-driven psychological experiment on, on billions of people all at once in a very, very short amount of time. And Really at its worst, technology has stripped away all emotion. Much of the digital world is, is just really purely functional. And the results are, um, I think, starting to show. We can push uh, you know, a button uh, on an app and we can get really anything we want, but it's not making anyone any happier. Um, we can talk to anyone at any time but more and more of us feel isolated. Um, we should be more connected than ever, but we're getting more and more fractured. And that's not what was supposed to happen. Um, and, I, and I don't think it needs to happen in the way it has been happening. I think technology can do so much more than bring us food and shelter. I think it can help us belong I think it can help us feel connected. But uh, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Let's get back to that later. So I've been fascinated um, by the hollow experiment for a long time. Um, and the reason why is, is uh, it's not that complicated for, for me. Because when I was 11 years old, my mom died suddenly. In, in a car accident. And <clears throat> the reason the experiment has fascinated me is because I think in many ways, I'm like those monkeys. Now, I was a, I was a pretty happy kid. Um, that's a photo of me and my mom. I was, I was very social, I had a lot of friends, but you know, like most kids, uh, my mom was everything to me. 
And she was she was really the the, the kindest person uh, I knew. And so when she died, it was like a light went out. Um, I just I just wanted to be alone. I just wanted to be left alone. Um, I really didn't want to talk about my mom. It was too hard. It's still too hard. Um, so for a long, long time, I didn't even uh, didn't even say her name. But but time uh, you know doesn't stop. Grief doesn't make the world stop. Um, life went on. Uh, I grew up. I went to university and I started playing around with things like design and the internet. And at this time, I wasn't the social kid anymore. I never really got that back. I had a hard time connecting um, with the people in my life. But I slowly realized that I was actually pretty good at doing it online. I could create things that, that people connected with. Um, so, um, you know, home alone, I could create things like websites and apps and, you know, whatever. Um, and and I, I obsessed over these things. I, I, I poured everything I had into them and, um, you know, worked late nights and, and weekends like, you know, like many of us do. And and over the years, I often ask myself and, and you know, my um, you know, people around me ask me, why are you doing this? Um, why are you why are you obsessing? Um, it's just it's just a website. Um, it's, it's just it's just an app. So why why do I care? Why do I obsess? Um, and I never had a good answer to be honest. I I I didn't fully realize it at the at the time. Um, but for me, those things that I was creating uh, was was a way for me to connect with other people. Um, I was trying to help them maybe solve a problem. I was trying to help them enjoy a moment. I was trying to be helpful. I was trying to reach out. Um, so I did this for a long time. And, and um, you know, after, after about 15 years of, of working on design and technology, I, I got a big break. Um, I saw an opening. And I, I sort of cheated myself into a position where I, I got to lead uh, a new initiative at Google. Um, and you know, through a little bit of, of, of maneuvering, I was tasked with the creation of uh, what became the Google Santa Tracker. Um, and I had worked on fairly large projects before, but this one was really you know the biggest by far. And over the next few months, I, I assembled uh, a global team, and we made games, and we made videos, and we made all sorts of just silly, wacky, fun things. Um, and again, I obsessed. I spent all my waking hours on this thing for, for months. Um, and then it launched, and in short, the project was, was a huge success. Um, it was used by millions and millions of people in just a few days. It was, um, it was loved. And, uh, and people spent, you know, hours playing with this thing. Um, it made people happy, um, and I made people happy. And what I realized is that made me happy. So it's easy to look, take a look at something like the Santa Tracker and, and dismiss it as, as frivolous. It's, it's just a bunch of games. It's just, it's just a website. So again, why do I obsess? But, but I, I recently, a few months ago, I shared the, the Santa Tracker story on, on Twitter um, and someone replied and, and told me their story, their experience um, with the Santa Tracker. And the tracker had helped them through a time in their life that was hard. And when I saw that, it just it instantly reminded me of something that I hadn't thought about, and I think I had blocked out. Um, because in the days and weeks after my mom died, like I said before, I didn't want to talk to anyone. 
I didn't want to see anyone. I just wanted to be alone. I just stayed alone in my room. And, and the way I, I processed, processed her death was, was playing this stupid handheld Donkey Kong video game. Um, I just played this thing over and over and over again. It was how I, I coped through a situation that was just far beyond any 11-year-old's coping abilities. Um, and for me, this wasn't a game. This was really a lifeline. Um, as I said, uh, through the years, I've, I've, I have never really processed my my mom's death. It, it just it's, it's been too hard. Um, but you know, I'm I'm over I'm over forty years old. Um, I, I have to deal with this at some point. So I, I started to think about my mom again um, sometime last year, and and sort of. Um, really because although she's obviously never left my mind i always tried to push her memory away because thinking about her uh, and even talking about her would just bring me pain and would it would very quickly bring me to tears so i, I couldn't even talk so i decided that i really wanted to change that so i sent out a message on on facebook in Icelandic, so most of you can't read this. But I, I asked, um, you know, my, my, my family, my friends on Facebook um, to send me photos and, and send me stories. Uh, but mostly, I, I really wanted to get a video because um, I hadn't seen my mom move. I hadn't seen a video of my mom in over 30 years. Um, and through, you know, through this tool, through technology, through Facebook, um, the post found its way to people I would otherwise never have reached, people I had never met, never known. Um, and they started to send me all sorts of things. So uh, I, got a, I got photos, uh, a bunch of them. Here she is with her parents uh, and her sisters. She's the, the youngest one sitting there in her, in her mother's lap. Here she is in a, in a polka dot dress with a bunch of very unhappy kids. And I got hundreds of these pictures from all sorts of people. Um, again, people I'd never met from different stages in her life. And for the first time, I even noticed that she looks a lot like my daughter. But then I think something really magical happened. For the last 30 years, as I said before, I, had, I hadn't seen a video of my mom. I've only seen photos. Um, but then someone I didn't know, who I'd never met, never heard of, sent me this video. And, and for the first time, I saw her again, with me sitting on her, looking stupid, and there she was, she was smiling and, and waving, enjoying life with me. And then a few months later, I got another video. It was a birthday party. And um, you see this in a second uh, as the camera pans uh, in a little bit. You see a kid on a, on, a, on a chair, and behind him is a, is a woman. The kid is me, and the, the woman is my mom, sitting on a couch uh, behind me. And she's going to stand up and she's going to speak to me. And what she said was, 
Um, this was the first time in 30 years I heard my mom's voice. She said, um, <clears throat> I'll come back and pick you up later, Holly. I've listened to that clip over and over again since I can't really put into words the effect it had on me. Um, after all this time, I was connected with her again. Now, social media gets blamed for a lot. Um, and much of it is, is totally valid, very valid. But, but none of this would have happened to me without social media. I don't think it's just a website. I don't think it's... It's just an app. So this is the journey that I've been on recently. Um, I've been thinking about the Harlow experiment on the Reese's Monkeys, um, about my mom dying, and the effect that had on me, and about the impact that technology is having on the world. Uh, I've been thinking about uh, my experience with design and technology and how it led me um, to create the Santa Tracker and the impact that had on people for only for a little while. And I thought about how technology had connected me to people that helped me see and hear my mom for the first time since I was a kid. About all the connections that technology can create if we use it correctly, and about all the potential and all the good that it could do that it can do. And all these stories and threats led me to tell you about why I do the things that I do, about why I personally love design I, and I love the internet. I do all this because I believe it's, it's possible. And I believe it because I've seen it. I believe in that it's possible to deliver on this unifying promise of technology. I believe it can connect us. I, I, I believe it can help us belong. It can create real human moments, um, moments of joy, moments of, of love, um, and it can help us process grief. It can make our lives better and richer and more beautiful. And I think it can make us more human. Technology doesn't need to be just functional. It doesn't need to be just food and shelter. It can be so much more. And I think all of us that work in this field are, are, need to be here to deliver on this promise, to deliver on this promise of technology. So for myself, I want to create things that are functional, absolutely. I want to help things, make sure that people are able to do the things that they want to do but I also want to create emotion. I want to combine function and feeling in all of my work. Because I believe in a future where technology makes people's lives better, where they feel connected and where they feel loved. I don't think that future will come without us working for it though. So I believe it's a future that is worth fighting for. And I believe that it's my job to do everything I can so that future becomes real. So that's why I do what I do. That's why I obsess over everything I create. And that's why I show up every day and that's why I'm here talking to you. I'm, I'm here to tell you that the work that we do needs to have meaning. Otherwise, it's just um, a meaningless quest to create a perfect design system. So, you know, don't get me wrong, design systems are great. We use them all the time, but they're just tools. And what we build with our tools and why we build those things is ultimately all that matters. So, yes, obviously, master your craft, but don't forget to work on mastering your humanity. Dig deep in yourselves and do what you can to make the world better through your work.